So now I'm going to talk about basic install and setup and perform a demonstration of how to set up a two node cluster. So first off, all the commands in GPFS start with the letters MM. And I found this very distracting and it made the commands look very, very complicated. And so I found that it helps to understand that MM stands for multimedia because GPFS was originally a research project for a multimedia file system. And that helps me get through the distraction. And also because a lot of the commands for GPFS might overlap with regular file system commands, the prefix of MM allows us to avoid naming collisions. You should know that GPFS is by default installed under slash user slash LPP slash MMFS. And MMFS, of course, stands for Multimedia File System. And for convenience, what I'd like to do is put the bin directory of MMFS into my system path so that I don't have to keep typing the full path name for these commands. Now, on the right, what you see is the process. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to define the cluster. What nodes are going to make up my cluster? Once I've defined that, I'm going to start it up. And these will fire up the engines for GPFS. Then I'm going to define which disks I'm going to use for the file system. And then I'm going to create the file system. And then I'm going to mount the file system on all the nodes, and then it becomes available for use. When I create my cluster, I'm going to define one of the nodes to be my cluster manager node. The cluster manager node is going to manage the cluster, such as detecting failures, managing recovery processes, determining if quorum exists, so on and so forth. Next, in my cluster, I'm going to define a number of nodes to have a quorum role. A node quorum is the minimum number of nodes that must be running in order for the file system to be available. This is actually used to prevent split brain scenarios. When I create the cluster, these roles need to be assigned. Often we'll define three, five, or seven quorum nodes in the cluster. So the first command I'm gonna run is MMCR cluster. The input to this command is a text file with the different nodes that are gonna to belong to the cluster and the roles that they're gonna play. So for example, I have two management nodes defined in the text file and I have three data nodes and I have my quorum nodes selected. When I run MMCR cluster, we're going to provide as input this node list, as well as tell GPFS for this file system, which utilities to ship commands across the cluster. So in this case is SSH and which utility to use to ship files across the cluster. In this case, SCP. Upon completion of this command, we've only defined the members of the cluster and their roles and nothing has really happened yet. There's no disks, there's no file system created. We've only defined what the cluster is. There's an additional step at this point where we run MMCH license, where we apply license files to the nodes. My next command is MM startup. If I run this command without any options, it's going to start up GPFS only on the local node. If I have a dash A flag, it's going to start up GPFS on all nodes. Once my cluster is defined, I can run MMLS cluster to see its configuration details. So for example, I can see the cluster name, a cluster ID. I can see the commands it will use to execute other commands and ship files. I can see that the first three nodes are quorum nodes and the fully qualified domain name of the nodes that make up this cluster and their IP addresses. The next step is to define our NSDs. There are three commands to be familiar with. MMCRNSD means create NSD, so that's adding disks to our cluster. MMDELNSD means remove disks from our cluster. And finally, once I've got all my disks defined, I can use MMCRFS, create file system, to stand up the file system. The create NSD command only requires the stands of file, which will define what NSDs exist, what nodes they're attached to, what their pool memberships are and their role, metadata or data or metadata and data, for example. And of course, their failure groups as well. If I make a mistake, I can run MMDEL NSD with the same file to kind of reset the environment, make my changes in my stanza file and rerun again. Once the NSDs are defined, I can run the MMCRFS command to create the file system. One of the parameters will be what device I want to call it. 
So in this case, it's slash dev slash bi underscore GPFS. Because this will be a new unique device, we want to use a device name that does not already exist on the nodes. Once file system creation completes, all the nodes will see this device and can mount it. Here I have two virtual machines, each with Red Hat Linux installed, and they're called node one and node two. So let's begin. Now GPFS is a kernel level file system, which means that it does require some integration with the kernel. So after installing GPFS, we do have to do a step where we compile to link with the kernel. So let's make sure we have the necessary prerequisites to do a compilation with the kernel. What I'm looking for is, in addition to the kernel that's installed, the development packages as well as kernel headers, which I don't have. Now just to make sure, I'm going to also check my current kernel version that I'm booted into. And you can see that I am running kernel 2.6.32.504, which matches the kernel module I have loaded. And I'm going to install the other kernel components required. Now I know that my node 2 is pretty much the same as my node 1, so I'm going to run the same command on node 2. So now I can see that all the required kernel pieces are in place. I've got my headers, got my actual kernel, and I've got development, and they are all the same kernel versions. Next, to compile, I'm going to need a GCC C++ compiler. So let's see what we have here. And I don't have what I need, so what I'm going to do is install them. So I'll need both the GCC and GCC C++ packages. And I'm going to do the same thing on my node 2, because they're exactly the same. Now for convenience, we've placed the software under slash software. So if I ls l slash software, you will see that there's my installation file. So I'm just going to run that program to extract out the RPMs. And I'm going to also add a silent flag to it. And what this will do is, in addition to extracting the files, we'll also simultaneously accept the license agreements. And now I will do the same on node two. Now what this is actually doing is it has placed the files under user LPP MMFS. Remember that MMFS is where the home of GPFS is. And we'll see a directory called 411 and there's nothing else. Inside 4.1.1, which is the version number, I see all the RPMs related to the current release of GPFS. And what I'm going to do is install these RPMs. And I'm going to do the same thing on node two. But I will have to put the full path here. Now that I have all the RPMs in place, 
I can actually compile the compatibility layer. So here's my GPFS files. I can see everything's installed. But I can't yet start a GPFS until I link it with the kernel. So there's a command called mmbuildgpl. This command will check that I have all dependencies and link GPFS with the kernel. And I'll do that as well on my node 2. Now for my own convenience, I'm going to put the GPFS bin path into my local path. I can also put this into my local bash RC for convenience for any new logon that I do. The first step we're going to do is actually define the cluster, which nodes are going to be part of my cluster. For convenience in this lab, I've created a file called node list, which does exactly that. In this file, node list, I've got two nodes defined. Now I'm going to run the mmcr cluster command to create the cluster. And again, my parameters are the file that defines the nodes in the cluster, the command I wish to use to ship commands across the nodes, and the command I wish to use to ship files across the nodes. The next thing I'm going to do is apply the licenses to take care of this warning here. So I'm going to accept the server license across the two nodes and it says it is completed successfully. Now that I've defined my cluster, I can run mmls cluster to see the nodes in my cluster. So here we have the cluster name and we have the commands we're gonna use for utilities and I have the nodes that are members of my cluster. But at this point, the cluster isn't started yet, nor have I defined any storage. And so the next thing we're gonna do is start up GPFS across all nodes. Now remember that if I don't have any parameters, this would only start up the current local node. So I want to have the dash A flag to start up GPFS on all nodes. And because GPFS knows which nodes are part of the cluster, it will run this command on all nodes. I can run that command from any node. Now I can run mmgetState to actually see the status of the cluster. Now I can see that all my GPFS nodes are active. Now the next step is to define the disks that will be used for my GPFS cluster. Now on this node, I can see what drives are available. I've got SDA, partition one and partition two. That's my operating system drive. And so I'm not gonna touch that. I've got three additional disks, SDB, SDC and SDD, and these are raw unformatted virtual disks. I have the same setup on my data node two. So what I'd like to do is add disks SDB, SDC, and SDD to my cluster as NSDs. To do that, I'm going to create my stanza file. Now I've pre-created one in my home directory called stanza.txt. So you can see in the stanza file, we start with a pool definition and we have a system pool, okay? And for the system pool, we're gonna use a block size of 256K. And this makes sense because for metadata, we want smaller block sizes. We're gonna find a second pool called FPO data, which is for the Hadoop cluster. And the block size is gonna be one megabyte. And this makes sense because we want to have larger blocks for, for Hadoop files, which ex we expect to be large. 
Now for block grouping factor, we're going to use 128. And this is what's going to give us 128 megabyte chunk sizes to be similar with HDFS. Now, now once we've got our pools defined, we're going to define what our disks are going to be for each node. So here's an NSD line that says, I have a node one SDB, the device, that's the label name. That's just a unique name. The device is this disk here, disk B. It's going to be on node one and I'm going to use it for metadata only. The failure group is 101 system pool. Same thing for node two, SDB. The server is node two, metadata only, failure group 102, and system. Now for data disks, we have SDC and SDD for node one. And so we see here the usage is data only for that SDC and data only for SDD. And because these disks are part of the same node, here, node one, they're both gonna have the same failure group number. Now I could also put here a three part number, but because it's a small cluster, I'm not using three part numbers here. Um, I could use rack number, rack position, and node number, but I've decided just to use a single number here. For node two, very similarly, I've got node two labels for disk C and disk D. Here's the devices on that node. They, will, they are both members of node two and they will be used for data only and they have the same failure group number but different from node one. So now I'm going to use this tensor file to create the disks. So now I've essentially added those disks to the cluster. Now that I have NSDs defined, I can go ahead and create a file system. So to do that, I'm going to use the command mmcrfs. My first parameter is where I want this device to be found on the nodes. So this will be a new device name that doesn't exist currently. We'll call it hadoopfs, and we'll give it the same stanza file. And now my file system is created. The next step is to mount it so that I can use it. Now I'm using a dash A flag because I want all nodes to mount this device. That way all nodes can access the file system. As a last step, we need to actually define a policy. When I have more than one storage pool, we want to tell GPFS how to utilize the pools. And what we want to do is have our metadata in the system pool and our regular data in the FPO pool that we set up. So let's take a look at a policy here. A policy is just a list of rules. And here we have a single rule called default rule, set pool FPO data. So we want to place our data there. So we're going to run a command called MMCH policy to set the policy for HadoopFS. Okay, and now that policy has been installed and broadcast to all nodes. So now we can actually validate that our GPFS is working. If I look at the mount command, I will see that dev HadoopFS has, an, has been mounted on slash GPFS HadoopFS. So if I go to GPFS and I go to HadoopFS, there's nothing here, but it is a POSIX kernel level file system. It's a distributed file system. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to echo hello world to a file. Let me try that again. So I've got my file. If I cat the file, I can see its contents. Now, if this is working, I should be able to go to node two and I'll see that node two has also mounted this file system. 
So let me go now to that place. And I, lo and behold, I see my file there. And I can see the data. So now my distributed file system on GPFS is set up and I can actually have my Hadoop running on this file system instead of HDFS. Now what I wanna do is talk about how GPFS actually functions with Hadoop. In a regular Hadoop world, what we have is disks that are attached to a node and those disks are formatted with ext4 file system, which is the most common file system for Linux. Now HDFS is a virtual file system based on Java that runs on top of ext4. On top of that file system is the file system API. So HDFS is an implementation of the Hadoop file system API. And so applications work with the file system by calling these APIs. On the right-hand side, you'll see how things are similar and slightly different at the same time for GPFS. GPFS is a kernel level file system. It's not a file system on top of another file system. And so it's intimately aware with the devices. So here you see GPFS directly on top of the disks. To understand Hadoop API calls, there is the GPFS Hadoop connector. And so just like how HDFS is an implementation of the Hadoop file system API, so is the GPFS Hadoop connector. It implements the Hadoop file system API. When a Hadoop application issues a Hadoop file system API command, those commands are accepted by the Hadoop connector, which then translate the API to the GPFS native API. Just to kind of wrap up the most common commands, we have mm mount, which is to mount the file system, and you saw that in the demo, mmu mount to unmount the file system, mm shutdown to shut down the file system, and you also saw mmch policy, which was to apply a default policy of where to place data. So that's the end of my presentation. Hope you learned something. Thanks for watching.